Hey guys, Coder Crypto here. This video is actually on a trade that I took on Doge on March 28th, which was a couple of weeks ago. I shared this video on Twitter, and as I said, with my return to YouTube, I'll be posting some of the content that I've posted on Twitter back here on YouTube for those that may not have seen it. This is a trade that I took a couple of weeks ago, but in this video, I actually broke down the logic behind the entry, the logic behind the exit. Everything was shared in real time when I took the actual trade. And then this is kind of a dissection of how I approached the trade and how I managed risk to ultimately turn what was a risk of $25,000 to $180,000 essentially overnight. So a very solid trade that ended up netting about 8R, meaning for every dollar that was risked, about $8 was made. And again, in the span of within around 24 hours. So a lot of people were curious about how I did that. And so I went ahead and recorded a video explaining the logic behind everything, my entire thought process through the video. So if you're interested in, in actively trading, then this video is for you. Of course, none of this is financial advice, but I think it's worth understanding and learning how to approach these markets in the way that I do. I know many are interested in that. So this video is for you guys. I will emphasize to actually take note about the price action that developed since I recorded this video. And this was on March 28th, a couple of weeks ago. And I actually talked about towards the end of the video, my expectations for Doge moving forward and also talking about downside targets, which fast forward two weeks from now, we've actually tagged almost to the dot. So go ahead and pay attention to the price action that I discussed towards the end of the video. And you can actually go and look at today's chart and see that it played out fairly well. That's it for this intro guys. And I hope you guys enjoy the video. Hey guys, Koto Crypto here with a video update on the Doge trade that I took a couple of days ago. I actually tweeted this trade out while I was in the middle of shopping and I posted this chart from my phone. At the time that I made the entry, I posted a stop loss as well, which was at this black line. And then I closed the trade the next day, I believe for a profit of $180,000 as you guys can see. So there was a lot of questions surrounding this trade. You can see the move was fairly small, average entry around 0.198 cents and average exit around 0.216. So not a massive move. I think that's about 10 to 20% at the most in terms of size of the move and resulted in a profit that was pretty significant. I also then further tweeted that initially, if you had taken the trade with a setup that I had provided at the time of entry, this would have been a two hour trade. And so to expect a profit as big as I had, you would assume that I'd risked about $90,000 in the trade. In reality, there was only ever a maximum of $25,000 risk on this trade, which with a profit of 180,000 effectively makes it a seven hour trade. And so I wanted to discuss how that happened, getting a lot of questions about it. And I said, if I get a thousand likes on the tweet, I'd make a video to explain. So this is that video. And so, yeah, let's just go ahead and jump right into it, guys. So this is the Doge chart. And first of all, I'll talk about what made me enter the trade. If we go down to the lower time frames, it was a lower time frame impulsive movement. The chart that you're seeing here on Twitter, you can see that stop loss was just under underneath 19 cents, entry was around 20 cents. So this was exactly what we were looking at at the time when I shared this. The stop loss was right here and the entry was at around 0.199. So our entry was right about here. We'll highlight this is where the entry was, okay? And so you can see here as shared on Twitter, entry at 0.1999, stop loss at that low there. So why did I enter this trade, guys? Very clean and clear impulsive price action here. These make for some really good entries if you're able to identify them. So just to zoom out a little bit, we had Doge kind of consolidating here. We started moving up and you can see here on the lower time frames that we had impulsive price action. And what we're looking for is a series of higher highs and higher lows. In this case, it was on the lower time frames, but you can see these higher highs and higher lows play out on multiple time frames. But anytime you get a lower time frame impulse, typically the idea is that a lower time frame impulse leads to a higher time frame impulse, right? And the invalidation is a break beneath the low of the start of that impulse. And so here we had a very clear impulse printed on lower time frames, and we had a retracement. The idea was if I buy this retracement, put a stop loss below this low, I can probably catch the next impulse to the upside. Now I had some people ask me when I took this trade and when I first shared it, what's your take profit target? And somewhere in the comments, you'll see that I replied, I don't have one yet. I just want to see how things develop. The idea was that I didn't know how significant of a move this would develop into. Maybe it ended up being just a simple consolidation correction and then another simple impulse up to complete what could be what we like to call like a three leg corrective structure. And then maybe then we would dump or maybe it would evolve into a much larger impulse of a much bigger magnitude. So at this time, I wasn't sure what it was going to evolve to. So I didn't have a set take profit target. I just wanted to position myself after this retracement, regardless of what this would ultimately amount to, I would be in position to ride it 
right? In this case, I ended up taking profits the next day, but the idea was I wasn't sure what a take profit target would look like. I just wanted to be positioned if and when we were to break out. So entered right here on this dip, right around the green square here, you can see that we continue to move down. However, we never hit the invalidation where my stop loss was, and instead we based out and then saw another move to the upside. I went to bed and the next morning I woke up to this move here. Let's go ahead and mark off where I took profit, which was at 0.2165. So we'll go ahead and mark that level off here. That's where I took profit. And you can see that obviously since then, we have now bled back down. Ultimately, we ended up retracing this move, which means that taking profit at these levels was a good idea. Again, we'll talk about why I did that here. But I wanna talk about how I played this position in order to increase my position size to ultimately net much more than I would have. So initially when I took this trade, I was risking about $25,000. So the entry was right around 0.199. Stop loss was at this low here. Target unknown, right? But ultimately we ended up taking profits at 0.216. So that was about a 1.5R setup. So again, risking 25K initially, we'll go ahead and write that down here. Risking 25K profit from this trade would end up being 1.5R. So 25 times 1.5 is approximately 37.5K of profit. This was the initial trade setup that was shared. And then basically what I did was was watched as price action developed and saw the opportunity to compound or add to this position while reducing risk at the same time. So again, the idea was that at no point in time during this trade was I risking more than 25K. So when I saw an opportunity present itself to compound this position, what that also meant was that I had the ability to raise my stop loss. I've had people ask me this question, when do you raise your stop loss? Some people like to raise their stop loss to their entry as soon as they get a move up. And I've previously said this, that anytime you raise your stop loss, there has to be a reason to raise it. There has to be some reason that tells you that if your idea is still valid, we should not go below X level. When I first took this trade, again, that invalidation level was at the lows of this impulse because as long as we stay above the lows of this impulse, any sort of corrective price action here is fair game as long as you don't go below. Therefore, this marked my invalidation level. But as price action developed, we were able to identify a new invalidation level and this allowed me to raise my stop loss up and then compound, or I should say, add to the position. The new stop loss was down here at this low and I identified this level after we saw this break to the upside here, the shift in market structure. What you have here is you have a correction. We know that after this impulse, we're gonna get a correction. And what we're looking for is some sign that this correction may be over or some indication that the low for this correction is in. So what we had here off the highs was a local downtrend, right? A series of lower highs and lower lows in a corrective manner. And you can see there was a first shift in this downtrend on a break of these highs right here. So at this point, when we broke above this level here, we finally had a shift in this series of lower highs and lower lows. Now we had a low put in, and now we had a higher high put in, what some will call a shift in market structure or a break in market structure here on the lower time frames. So we identified this break in market structure. We also had this last move that preceded it go down and actually take this local low. So we had what we like to call like a sweep of liquidity at the local lows, and that was followed by a break in market structure. So what that meant was that we now had a local level here, which is a local area of demand that we'd expect buyers to step in at if we're now shifting structure from a local downtrend to a local uptrend. And we know again that this is an impulse and that what follows an impulse after correction is another impulse. So it's simply a matter of time, right? We know that eventually we're gonna bottom out somewhere between these highs and these lows down here at 0.18, which is where our original stop loss was. And if we can identify where that bottom takes place, we can possibly add to our position and go up with an even larger position. So that's exactly what we did here. We identified a shift in structure from the lower time frame bearish trend to a lower time frame bullish trend. There's a decent chance now that this correction in terms of depth is over and we're now getting ready for that next impulse. And so we were then able to raise our stop loss from the original position to these local highs here. And you can see that if I was originally risking 25K, I'm now only risking around less than half of that. So around 12K. So we'll go ahead here and write we're risking 10K with the new stop loss. This allowed me to then go ahead and open up a new position, risking an additional 15K. Went ahead and placed my limit bids here. We had an area of demand, which is this last down candle before the break in market structure. We had two almost equal lows here. So I'm basically thinking, I'll place my bids here. We might get a wick to take these lows and I'll place my stop loss here, targeting who knows what, but ultimately ended up closing here. That was another 8.7R compounded, right? Okay, we were risking additional 15K on this new compounded position. That gave us an 8.7R. We'll round it up to a 9R just to make it easy. 9R on a 15K trade is a profit of 135K. So this we were risking additional 15K. Total risk is now back to 25K. And profit for this portion of the trade was 15K times about nine, which is 135K. And so if you add on now the total profit of the original position and the compounded position, you get 170K, give or take. 
And again, we ended up closing this position for a profit of 180K. If you add those two together, you get 180K profit. And that's how I was able to take advantage of the lower time frame structure to compound this original position that should have only yielded me a profit of 37.5K to ultimately yield a profit of 180K and always keeping risk the same at 25K. Never did I risk more than 25K throughout this whole process, but I was able to take advantage of the lower time frame price action to go aggressive and then multiply my profits by four to five X. Now guys, I want to talk about why I took profits here because this is also important. And it's part of the equation. For what reason did I decide to lock in gains as opposed to holding the trade for longer? And what are we looking at now in terms of Doge price action? Really briefly here, as you guys know, I did take this trade on Bybit and currently I am running a giveaway promotion with them as well, right here on my Twitter page, I'm giving away $10,000 a MacBook Pro and a PS5 for anyone who signed up and uses either of my partner exchanges, which includes Bybit and Woo. This pretty much details everything about that giveaway. The only requirements are that you sign up using my ref links, which are right here, and you deposit $100 onto either exchange giveaways every week. I actually have to announce the giveaway winner for yesterday, which was the first week on April 1st. Someone just won $1,000 and someone will win $1,000 next week. Again, if you want to participate, you can go ahead and sign up using my ref links on the pin post on my Twitter. Now with that out of the way, guys, let's jump back into Doge here and why I took profits. So the reason that I took profits on this trade was because again, what we're looking for is impulsive price action and a lower time frame impulse can either evolve into a much larger impulse or it can falter with a corrective move to the upside, in which case we may see a retracement. So what I saw here on the move up that caused me to take profits was this sort of choppy grind up and then we got a sharp move up and another corrective move up again. So we had an inefficiency or a gap here. This move here isn't really that clean. So we have choppy movement up till about here. And then we saw what looks like an impulsive move, but that was followed by another three-legged move here. So we had a three-legged correction here. And then we got this sort of choppy three-legged correction here. So this is not an impulsive move at the highs. This was not clearly impulsive either. You can argue that, okay, we had an impulse here, sideways here, and then maybe this was the third wave, and then this was the fourth, and then this was the fifth. And I'm with you up until this here, but this move was clearly corrective. So what we had in essence was like another three-legged move up. So what started as an impulsive movement ended up kind of devolving into corrective price action. If I zoom out even more, you'll see that where we were at at this point in time was also a very pivotal area that we could it's certainly reject from. You can see here that this is actually a key level I had marked off, a very key swing high. So anytime that we break above a key swing high like this, that's very significant, we're gonna do one of two things. We're either gonna break out and see an actual breakout where we continue to the upside, or we may see a rejection and a fall back inside the range. And so basically anytime we break above these levels, you wanna be paying attention to developing price action and you wanna be able to see if there's strength here forming or if there's weakness. And if there's weakness forming here, then it's possible that we're gonna fall back inside the range, which is exactly what we ended up doing. But your ability to recognize strength versus weakness is important here. And because I was able to identify that what started off as an impulsive movement ended up being corrective, I was able to lock in gains here preemptively, getting the idea that this may not end up being a true breakout and we may just see a deviation here. And you can see here, I locked in profits. We got a little bit of a choppy corrective move to the upside, more chop, more corrective moves than we fell back inside, broke market structure to the downside. And then we were unable to get back above these highs, broke back inside the range. And the rest is pretty much history. The thing is that while I took profits at the level that I took profits at, I could always jump back into the trade if I saw impulsive price action. If we again formed at some point here, another lower time frame impulse, then it's very easy for me to hop back in the trade with a new invalidation level. And so rather than hold on to this position when I'm seeing potential weakness at the range highs, I thought, let me lock in gains and I can always re-enter if the opportunity presents itself. And it turns out that was the right move as we ended up fully retracing that move and are now actually trading below. So that is why I took profits. You're looking at key higher time frame levels and interact actions around those levels. And then you're looking at structure and you're trying to identify if we're seeing a proper impulsive movement or a failed impulse that's now becoming corrective. And that'll help you identify when it's a good time to take profits or raise stop losses or any of the above. Where do I think Doge is going to go now and that we've fallen back inside this range? So I've marked off some key levels as you guys can already see here that I'll be paying attention to. And I'll just talk a little bit about those levels here as well. So we have the range lows, as you can see, have been marked off. We have this little inefficiency here or gap or whatever you want to call it. And we have this area of demand here that preceded the last leg to the upside. This move in and of itself that you're seeing here off of these lows, corrective move. And that's why you want to look for impulses. When you see an impulse, you get excited. When you see a corrective move, you need to understand that it can at any point in time be retraced. And so the move off of this lows looks impulsive. And then we kind of devolve into this chop and we now have a three-legged corrective move to the upside. In other words, just a ranging move. This isn't yet trending. This isn't yet a proper impulsive move to the upside that we'd be looking for. So what this tells me is that we're likely seeing some sort of a larger correct 
corrective structure, and that just means further ranging and chop before we're really ready to make the next leg to the upside here on Doge. So in terms of areas of interest on the downside, I will add that a lot of this is going to be dependent on what Bitcoin does here, right? So those of you who've been paying attention to my recent updates on Bitcoin, you know that we're looking at a potential move up on Bitcoin, but that could be followed by a potentially larger move down. So these levels that I've marked off here in green comes into play in the scenario in which Bitcoin does get that larger leg down. Right now, just based off of what we have here, lower time frame PA, you can look at this as like a consolidation and a breakdown. So your initial level of resistance on Doge on the lower time frames is going to be right here. If we fail to break above, we could probably continue bleeding and head down to these lows into this area of interest here at around 13 to 14 cents. If we break back above this local level, then we have what could be just a little low time frame deviation here, and we could go for a new high up here. But keep in mind, even if we make a new high here, unless it's in an impulsive manner, it doesn't mean much. This could still be just a corrective move, a new high here, and then we could potentially deviate back and fall back inside the range. So key levels of interest on the downside are going to be this cluster of consolidation that preceded this leg to the upside, this inefficiency right above. And if this region is lost, then again, we're looking at these range lows and we can look at some higher time frame levels. I won't go too much into that right now. We'll take it with this area right here, but this is what you're going to want to be watching for guys. Again, if I'm right about Bitcoin in terms of short-term PA and we are going to see a move up, then it's very likely that Doge could see another leg to the upside as well. And if we do get that, what you want to really be paying attention to here is whether or not that move is impulsive, right? And we talked about what an impulsive move looks like in terms of structure. You're looking for a clean and clear series of higher highs and higher lows without as much chop and overlap. The more chop and overlap that you get, the more likely you're seeing a corrective move. So what you're looking for is something like this to the upside. If you get this, that's a very promising sign. However, if you get something like this, where we break back above and we're retesting and then we sort of grind up without that clear impulsive structure, then don't be fooled by a break above these highs because while that looks like a potential breakout, it's more likely just a fake out before a larger move back down into the range and potentially to this area of interest down here at 13 to 14 cents. It goes without saying, but at all times you're considering context of Bitcoin along with any other coin that you're looking at because it's gonna play a big role. And you can even look at the Doge Bitcoin chart as well to get some additional confluence. But again, guys, that's what I'll be looking for here on Doge. Again, my area of interest is down here if we do see a rejection or if Bitcoin pulls back further. Otherwise, look for a move back up to these highs. Watch how the PA develops. And if I do see another impulse present itself here, I'll probably be interested in jumping into the trade and I may share that as well. So just keep your eye out for that. That's it for this video update, guys. If you enjoyed it, please like and share. I hope you guys learned a thing or two about how I manage these trade positions and I'll catch you guys in the next one.